Are synthetic humans the future of fashion, of influencers, of models? Welcome to Tech First with John Kutsir. So we have synthetic humans who are earning millions annually as influencers. We have models who are created by a computer. I want to dive into this whole space, what's driving it, where's it all going? And to do so, we're chatting with Tyler Lastovich, who leads strategy at Generated Photos. Tyler, welcome. Thanks for having me, John. It is super uh, great to have you. You're remote. You're you're a digital nomad. You're just like all the rest of us right now. You're in Wyoming. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. And I'm super... <laughs> I've been super eager to dive into this and dig into this because it's a crazy question, right? We have fake humans, synthetic humans who are massive influencers, um, million dollar a year influencers. We've got brands who are creating their own models, other things like that. You're a player in this space in a different way. What does Generated Photos do? Yeah, so Generated Photos is a, a company that does synthetic media creation. Um, so what we do is we use machine learning to actually basically train what's called a GAN or a generative adversarial network on a huge training data set. And it's human faces right now. And so what we can do is we can go through and create millions and millions of people essentially that have never existed, that are unreal. And so we make photorealistic virtual imagery. Very interesting. Where's the demand coming from? Why do clients want this? Sure, uh, we've seen demand all over the map, which has kind of been the most fascinating part of the company so far. Uh, we have a number of game developers that are coming in that can project our images over 3D characters and make kind of an infinite content dilemma solving problem. So that'll, we can talk more about that later on, but it's that's a very interesting space. We have people that are in professional institutes such as medical, law enforcement. Um, there's a bunch of people in the kind of security space that have been using our product. Um, think about like a court case or something like that where you don't want a real face. That's very good for us. Um, designers, obviously, you know, making designs, making products, uh, not having likeness rights is important. And just beyond that, just software companies, you know, user avatars, uh, demo software products where you can add in huge amounts of synthetic data to see if something's going to work right. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing a huge amount of innovation here, right? Uh, synthetic models, influencers, companions even. Uh, we can explore a lot of different things here. And there's also been an explosion of deep fake technology, which uses similar AI technology to, to, to create in a lot of cases. Part of this is because we can now, right? AI is just getting that good. Part of it is the demand that you're talking about right now. And it's it's new for us as a culture, as a society. It's new for us in technological terms. What are some of the ethical issues here? Well, yeah, that's a good point you raised where it really is new. And I think that's important to note that no one's really gone through this. We're one of the earlier companies that is kind of forging ahead through all of this. I think the the main concern that we see raised time and time again is the, the concern for racial bias uh, is probably number one for us, uh, where when you're producing imagery, having an algorithm that can kind of be uh, very normalized, it's very difficult in the machine learning space. Uh, up until now, machine learning has been a fairly biased field. You know, they actually work by using bias. I don't know how te technical we want to get, but uh, these machine systems go through gradients and they go through millions and billions of permutations and combinations to get good results. And to do that, they kind of hone in on special features of faces and likenesses. So what you need to have is absolutely huge amounts of training data and diverse training data. Uh, and so I think that bias in general is the, the hardest ethical point to see. We've seen the facial recognition systems from say Amazon or others kind of fail recently. And I think that's that's a big part of these digital synthetic model creations where I think the second part that we see a lot is uh, people fearing that they're gonna be put out of a job. That's yes. a very common kind of AI trope where, oh no, models will totally be you know replaced. It'll all be virtual, it'll all be fake. You know, and I, I honestly don't believe that. Uh, we actually employ quite a few models. I mean, we shoot all our own training data. We have all licensed models. We don't scrape any of our content. Um, we run a full photo studio. Um, and so I think that we can we can talk about that later too, but it's it's definitely one of the main concerns. So the model union has not reached out to you and said, you're, 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 <laughs> you're taking no. our jobs. No, not, not yet. I mean, we've 
had some interesting discussions with models uh, ongoing and sometimes it's a little harder to find people who really want to have their likeness shot and portrayed. Um, we do have enough models and people coming in that it shouldn't really look like any one person. Uh, we haven't really had any claims where it's like, this looks exactly like me, you know, take it down from the website, anything like that. Uh, we offer our photos completely free of likeness rights. So uh, I do believe that's that's pretty pretty unique in the industry. I think that most models today kind of have some synthetic component, whether they're Photoshopped or edited or something like that. There's a lot of this virtual production, especially with COVID. That's been a big thing for us yes. uh, coming through. So it's been really interesting. I, I, I love that you've brought up that most models that we have today are somewhat synthetic, uh, for, whether that's Photoshop, whether that's makeup, whether that's prosthetics, whatever it might be. Um, there is some element of something that's not entirely natural in probably the vast majority of models and actors that we see these days. We did see, uh, you remember Google brought out that product where it will phone somebody, Google Assistant will phone a restaurant and make a reservation for you, right? Um, and there was a lot of backlash because that synthetic voice didn't identify itself as I am a robot or I am the Google Assistant. Uh, and, and so they got backlash and so they actually added that. Is there a scenario where we need to do something for visual media along the same lines or is that just different? No, I, I definitely see that as an upcoming problem. Uh, I think that there's a lot of people working right now on the verification and validation uh, of synthetic content, especially AI produced media. I think there's a big kind of chasm between what you can use as normal content and what's presented as fact and news. And so we don't portray or suggest that people use that at all uh, in terms of a factual basis. Um, it, it will be at some point uh, a likelihood that you have to embed some sort of normalized tag or some sort of rec recognition system uh, into the images. But right now, nothing standardized. Um, there's no real validation or encoding loop to really do that. Uh, I think we'd be happy to work with whoever kind of comes through and has that. Um, we've been looking recently on adding different watermarks to images, potentially, um, yes. some little subtle things that, so that's, that's definitely in the current log that we're working on and looking at. So it's hard to balance, you know, people don't really want them in the images, to be honest, uh, since they're stock imagery, use them in designs. And so yeah, uh, it's kind of a pro and con on both sides. I, I think embedding it um, in the image in an invisible way, but something that is machine readable, even via a little bit of code in a browser or, or something like that, or in a camera um, software or photo editing software makes a ton of sense because then you've got some traceability, trackability of where it's from, that it is an ethically uh, sourced image and all those other things like that as well. It's interesting that you touched on the question of nobody has yet complained, hey, that synthetic human looks exactly like me because that was what I was wondering you know is there one that looks like me <laughs> right and you've created almost three million so far and I'm sure that's mm -hmm. just the um just the, the 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 tip of the iceberg I'm sure you're going to create millions and millions more over time as well uh, so that may come but you've launched something that is quite interesting you've launched a privacy product can you talk a little bit about that and why you did it yeah, but that was an interesting launch. It's really kind of caught fire uh, on Twitter and around the web. So it's been really interesting. So it's called the Anonymizer. And uh, what it does is it uses uh, an additional machine learning technique where it does facial recognition on a photo that you upload. And what it effectively does is it finds uh, a near match through our images. Um, so it, depending on what we're doing, we're either going to generate or find an existing photo uh, in our database. And so it basically just pulls in your synthetic alternate, you know, if you had a second face, uh, that's close to what it would come through as. Um, and so yeah, people have been using it. I've seen them all over on the web already. You know, I've had someone follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter that has a synthetic face and I can recognize it's one of ours. So it's been pretty interesting. That is really interesting. Um, and, you know, we see that actually on social quite a bit, right? I, I see that quite frequently where somebody will say, hey, somebody is using my picture for their social um, and that's not me. Don't friend them. Right. So uh, almost a similar kind of a scenario there. And, and now you can kind of create your own digital avatar that is sort of like you, but not exactly like you. Yeah, and I, I think an important part of that really is the privacy aspect. You know, we had seen a number of journalists like yourself come through and ask to use our images as kind of privacy protections where they, they want to be anonymous, but they kind of still want to give a little bit of a likeness resemblance to themselves. You know, you don't want to completely misrepresent who you are online, but at the same time, you don't want to 
show up in facial recognition or identities or anything like that. So uh, we've had a number of people come in basically looking for that exact thing or to be able to find someone. I know it's kind of a weird case, but we had law enforcement, a number of them actually, looking to use like synthetic honeypot traps for predators. Oh wow! And so uh, they have a specific type or something like that that they're trying to lure people into. And so they can use their synthetic imageries because we do offer you know, all age ranges as well as children. And so sad as it is, say like young, young women, we can have a synthetic image generated. And so you don't actually have to use a real person. So that's a very valid use case, I think, for something like synthetic imagery that doesn't really get talked about as much in the media. No, I mean, that's not obviously something that you want to talk about a lot. It's a horrific area, but it is really good mm -hmm. that in the process of doing their work, they don't have to take pictures of real people real children that will be used in ways that you don't want. Nobody, no parent wants their child's image to be used in something like that. Correct. It's yeah. interesting that you mentioned law enforcement because I know some people in law enforcement as well, and they won't share things on social, especially not their face because there's, there, there's risk associated with that and risk, not just for them, but for their family. And it's funny as well uh, about, you mentioned some journalists because I know a PR rep, Jonathan Hershon, um, and he has made, it's his shtick. He's internet famous for it. He has never had a picture taken of him and there is no picture of him available online. I mean, he's, he's gone to conferences and, and taken huge precautions that nobody's taken a picture of him. Now he could create an image and, and use that. And I'm something like this. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating area and we've seen uh, a lot of use come through that. You know, it's been a really good launch for us. So right now you're doing faces, headshots. Uh, what's coming next? Are you going to do whole body? Are you going to get into video? Yeah, we definitely plan to get into both of those things over time. Uh, it's really hard to train stuff, I'll be honest. I mean, it takes a lot of GPU power uh, and a lot of compute to really go through these things. It's kind of at the cutting edge here. Uh, and so it does take time. We still have further refinements to go to get really photorealistic on faces. Um, I think when it comes down to say 3D characters or video game creation, faces really are what gets the, the bulk of the attention because that's what you focus on and that's what's kind of poor today. Clothing represents a, a very tough challenge uh, in terms of all the nuance and the creases and the very specific details yes. uh, for the systems that we're using. So we definitely do capture full training data, objects. It's not just people. I mean, we can use these same systems to do anything really. There's nothing that's really a limitation structurally to that. Uh, I think that right now we have a nice cleaned data set that we train on that's specifically optimized that again, we capture in our own photo studio under controlled conditions, you know, where the lighting's all nice and everything like that. So we have uh, very high resolution source files for faces, but going forward, we'll have all sorts of stuff. I think you're just scratching the surface of what will eventually be a target market here. Because for instance, if you look at like the Facebook avatar, I've worked hard to make a Facebook avatar in Messenger and other things like that, that looks somewhat like me, somewhat like me in Oculus as well, like Oculus Quest, you can make an avatar that's available. And you know, I can get sort of a ovalish face that's bald, <laughs> right? I, yeah. you know, is that me? Well, not really, no, it doesn't really look like me. There's much more that I would like to put in there and I can't do that. Also, as we get much more into augmented reality and VR, and we want to telepresent ourselves in, in, in some way, shape or form, you want to be able to do that in a way that whether it's true to life or not represents you as the way that you want to be seen. Right. Uh, so I think there's a huge market here emerging, uh, nascent right now, but coming for people to create lifelike avatars of themselves to use in situations like this, where we're having remote conversations. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I, I like to talk about and think about the metaverse. You know, that's kind of the upcoming concept of kind of the second world, second place, where it's not just people. Like you just explained so well, and everyone's going to want to have very deep customization of their likeness and how they're represented in their kind of second world, second life. But I think just equally hard is having enough content to fill out the world. So yeah. I call it the infinite content dilemma, where if you have an infinitely large world, you need an infinitely large amount of content to kind of seed it and to be un kind of underlying the whole thing. And so right now we're seeing really great advances in natural language processing and text, you know, GPT-3 from OpenAI and things like that can be melded really well with our characters. Um, there's all sorts of rigging models and stuff that can project our images, say on top of a 3D face and that face can then talk or things like that. And so 
kind of marrying all these technologies together will give you really, really deep interactions that have photorealism. So you'll be able to have Netflix videos that are procedurally generated to match your demographic or I'm ads sorry. that are very targeted. <laughs> you know, all of that type of stuff is definitely coming down the pipeline faster than I think people realize. Really, really fascinating. And, uh, you know, what does Siri look like when I have smart glasses and Siri can appear in my visual uh, frame of reference? Or what does Alexa look like? You know, what does she look like to me? What does she look like to you? Exactly. What does the Google Assistant look like? Um, <laughs> that is sexless and uh, genderless and 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 uh, everything else there. So, I mean, you could could be a fire hydrant for all for all I know. Um, but very interesting world that we're moving into. I want to ask you a couple questions because a little bit more personal because this podcast is about tech that's changing the world and innovators who are shaping the future. How big do you see generated faces and synthetic humans getting? Um, what percentage of models do you think will be created by a computer and will we all have uh, one or more avatars? I think so, yeah. At this point, you know, it's hard to imagine a world where we don't have a second likeness, a second representation online. I think that what we'll see in the next five or 10 years is really kind of a cross between the real world and the virtual world. So models probably won't exist as singularly just real or, or digital. I think these will kind of meld together. Right now, the biggest influencers that are CGI on say Instagram that are making the millions you've talked about are actually real models that are captured and then redone with CGI. And so I think there's kind of a meld between these two things that will persist for quite a while. At some point, I don't think realism is going to go away. I think there's still value to someone, how they look in real life. Authenticity is going to be a very big factor in that. I think just as you touched on the fact that verification is important for digital, I think it'll be almost even more important for real content. Um, and so going through that, I think we will all have uh, digital likenesses, digital representations, and some sort of digital augmentation, whether that's digital fashion or things like that. There's so many ways to go through this. But yeah, I, I really don't see a a limit that we can see from here. I think it'll just be massive. I, I couldn't agree more. And I see that when we have smart glasses and ubiquitous augmented reality, um, we will put on our avatars as we walk around in the street in real life, in meat space, and people who participate in our shared consensus reality will get the image that we intend to project of ourselves uh, in their own visual frame of reference. And uh, it will be a very, very interesting world. Tyler, this has been fascinating. Uh, you're doing some very interesting work. I wanna thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, it's been great. Excellent. For everybody else, thank you for joining us on Tech First. Uh, my name is John Kutsir. I appreciate being along for the show. You'll be able to get a full transcript of this podcast in about a week at johnkutsir.com, and the story at Forbes will come out shortly thereafter. Also, the full video is always available on my YouTube channel. Thank you for joining. Until next time, this is John Kutsir with Tech First. Mm -hmm.